All right, let's get started. Um, I'm sorry we're slightly delayed. The last class was uh, running over just a little bit. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, quadratic programs and cone programs today. Um, we'll see, uh, well, we'll start with definitions, but we'll see some um, applications uh, towards the end of this lecture or at the beginning of next one. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that there's um, a ton of recent research in machine learning and stats, which is based on the idea of trying to take interesting problems and turn them into quadratic programs or cone programs. Um, a couple of familiar examples are uh, Group Lasso, which is a second order cone program, uh, and Support Vector Machines, which are a quadratic program. So uh, we'll see more about that uh, in a bit, but um, uh, basically what we want to do is uh, get started. So a uh, quadratic program looks like this. Uh, we have, um, uh, it's an optimization problem with uh, m constraints and n variables. So we have a matrix, um, uh, a matrix, uh, there we go. Uh, a matrix uh, A, constraint matrix, which is our M by N. Uh, a matrix B, uh, sorry, a vector B, which is uh, the right-hand side vector for the constraints. Uh, that's a vector in our M. Uh, an objective vector in our N, number of variables. X is our variable, so it's a vector of variables in our N. Uh, and H is the quadratic part of our objective, so it's a, a matrix in uh, our N by N. Right? And so the goal is going to be to minimize or maximize um, X transpose uh, X transpose HX over 2. Uh, so a so a quadratic program like sorry about that. Do we have writing now? There we go. That was weird. Um, OK, so uh, to minimize or maximize a quadratic form, so x transpose hx over 2 plus a linear function of x uh, subject to linear constraints on x, ax less than or equal to b, or ax equal to b, or some combination of inequality and equality constraints. Um, and you might have constraints that some elements of X have to be non-negative as well. So uh, a typical example would be to maximize um, 2X uh, plus X squared plus Y squared subject to X plus Y less than 4, right, and all of these constraints. X and Y are non-negative variables. Now you might notice that this program here is not a convex optimization problem, right? We're trying to maximize a convex function. Uh, and in fact, uh, quadratic programs are convex optimization pro uh, problems uh, if we have uh, min uh, and the quadratic part is positive semi-definite or max and the quadratic part is negative semi-definite, right? So uh, it would look something like this, right? So we have a whole bunch of linear constraints, and then the ellipses are the contours of the objective. Uh, and you can just sort of see uh, that the optimum point, assuming that this is a uh, minimization problem, the optimum point is going to be somewhere there, because it's here that the contours of the objective are tangent to one of the constraints. And so you can see that unlike a linear program, right, we actually have uh, a strict interior maximum, right, the minimum. The minimum is at an interior point of one of the faces, uh, and that couldn't happen in a linear program, right, it would have slid along the face to either this corner or this corner, but because there's a quadratic portion, you can have a strictly interior minimum. All right? So does the problem make sense? Uh, looks like an optimization problem that we might care to solve. Yeah? Uh, it's strictly interior to the face, right? So you could have something, if you had a, um, you know, a quadratic with contours like that, right, we'd have a minimum and it's strictly interior to the entire feasible region. Right. Okay? All right. Um, uh, another... A uh, pretty useful optimization problem is a cone program. So again, we'll have m constraints and n variables, uh, and we'll have some linear constraints, ax plus b, but this time the constraint is not greater than or equal to zero or equal to zero. It's that ax plus b has to be inside a cone k, right? So here k is a cone in rm, 
uh, and ax plus b is a linear function of x that uh, lives in Rm. And so we're constraining that, uh, we're constraining ax plus b to be inside the cone. Uh, we can also have a cone constraint uh, on the variables themselves directly. So we have another co cone, this time L, which is a subset of Rn, uh, and x has to be inside that cone. Uh, and this is going to be a convex problem uh, if we have uh, both k and L uh, convex. Right? That makes sense? So um, this should look familiar to you because, for example, if we take um, uh, our cone to be, um, let's say, uh, the, the point zero to the p, right, p copies of zero, cross product with uh, q copies of r plus, right? So the elements of uh, ax plus b, that the first p elements of that, those are equality constraints, right? We're constraining them just to be uh, ax plus b to equal zero because it has to be inside this cone, which is just the origin. Uh, and here we're constraining ax plus b to be bigger than or equal to zero in its last q components, right? And so you can see that if you choose this particular um, uh, set of this particular cone, right, a, um, a, a cross product of a bunch of zeros and R pluses, we get standard linear programming equality and inequality uh, constraints. Uh, and then the same thing, right, if we have uh, that uh, same, same style for L, right, I guess I'll call that P prime and Q prime because they don't have to be equal to P and Q. Um, uh, actually, well, this is... This is maybe, it's possible, it's maybe not very interesting, right? I'm just constraining a bunch of my variables to be equal to zero. What I actually should have said was uh, all of R to the, let's say, Q double prime, right? And so here, this is a free variable. This is a non-negative variable, right? And so if I do this sort of constraints, I get uh, ordinary uh, linear programs, right? But if I take a more general cone, I can get a more general class of optimization problems. Make sense? All right. So here's an example of a cone program, right? I have these um, uh, ellipses, which I'm going to um, show in a sec how to represent them using cone constraints. Uh, and my feasible region is going to wind up being uh, everything inside the intersection of these two ellipses and some linear constraints, right? So everything out here is infeasible, right? And then subject to that, I want to go as far as possible in that direction. So here is the optimum point. Okay. And if I had said, for example, to go in this direction instead, um, right, I would have an optimum point somewhere here, right? And again, it would be uh, interior to one of the faces of the, uh, of the region, right? I guess it's kind of weird to call this a face, interior to one of the bounding curves of the region, right? So um, uh, mathematically, what we're going to do is we're going to minimize a linear function of x. We could also have maximize. Uh, subject to aix plus bi uh, is in ki. So uh, what we're going to do is have um, uh, ai uh, be a matrix in R uh, M I by N, right? Uh, so X will be a vector of variables in R N. Uh, A I will be in M I by N, and B I will be in uh, R M I, right? And so, uh, and then K I here will be uh, some combination of. Um, Equality constraints, uh, inequality constraints, uh, and then second order cones, right? And the second order cone is just uh, um, x comma, actually, let's use y because we used x as the variable, uh, y comma t such that the, such that the uh, two norm of y is less than or equal to t, right? And so this will be in R m, t will be in 
R, and this will be the second order cone in R m plus one. Okay. Yeah. Um, I figure the quadratic gives it some bend, so it will, that might not be extreme, but it can be Right, so, so um, because the objective function is linear, we're only going to wind up having optima at boundary points of the feasible region here. I mean, expo like, so exposed in the sense that if I take a supporting hyperplane and intersect it in the feasible region, that the intersection is zero to the I see. So, um, is it possible to have a, an optimum at a point which is neither exposed, uh, not a vertex? Not a, vertex. Um, not a unique optimum? You could have an optimum there, but it couldn't be unique, right? So you could, if the objective vector C were zero, every point is, op, is an optimum, right? But uh, in general, you're not going to have a unique optimum unless you are at a... Um, Vertex or uh, an outwardly curved point of one of the uh, one of the bounding curves. Yeah, that's correct. That's what I'm. Um, all right. So uh, that's a, a second order cone program, right? So uh, linear inequality and equality constraints and second order cone constraints on linear functions of your variable. Your variables can also be restricted to be non-negative if you prefer or restricted to be in a second order cone if you prefer. Uh, those are all special cases of, of this. Uh, and so what that means well, what can you get by intersecting a plane with the second order cone? That's something that you may remember from uh, geometry uh, over those many years ago, right? It's conic sections. Uh, I think even thousands of years ago, the Greeks studied these things. Uh, but you get things like parabolas, hyperbolas, ellipses, and circles. Uh, and in two dimensions, um, you know, those, those four curves are the exhaustive list, and they generalize to higher dimensions and are, are still exhaustive in, in the higher dimensions. So uh, here we have, for example, uh, an ellipse that you get by taking uh, a slightly tilted plane and chopping off the, the bottom point of the cone, right? And here we get uh, a hyperbola. This is just, you get one branch of a hyperbola here because the second order cone only extends in one direction, uh, but it's still a hyperbola, and uh, the inside of the hyperbola is a convex set. All right. So uh, pretty pictures of conic sections. Um, just, to, just for a little bit of uh, exercise, we can show that quadratic programs are uh, reducible to second-order cone programs. So this is um, uh, both so that you know the relationship between the two of them and also to give you a little bit of uh, practice manipulating these things. So we have some quadratic program which uh, looks like minimize a convex quadratic function subject to some constraints, which I'm not going to write. And the idea is going to be that we're going to change that to be uh, minimize t plus c transpose x subject to t is greater than or equal to x transpose h x over 2 uh, and all of those other constraints, right? And so the goal is going to be to show how to implement this using a second order cone constraint, okay? So um, I'm going to start out by factoring uh, h is equal to uh, r transpose times r. So we can do that, for example, with a Kolesky factorization, which is possible on any positive semi-definite matrix. Um, and so that means that uh, x transpose h x is equal to x transpose r transpose rx, right? And if I parenthesize it like this, that's equal to the two norm of rx squared, right? So you can see now how we're going to start to get the two norm cone involved in this. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, make the constraint that says that uh, rx, t, and t plus 1 has to be in the second order cone, right? So uh, if we write that out, um, that's saying that uh, uh, t plus 1 has to be bigger than or equal to the two norm of this vector with rx and t, right, which is the square root of uh, rx two norm squared plus 
t squared, right? Whole thing square root. That's the two norm. Um, both of these things are going to be non-negative, right? And so squaring them is a monotone transformation. So I'll go ahead and square them. Uh, that's going to be t squared plus 2t plus 1 greater than or equal to uh, rx 2 norm squared plus t squared, right? Uh, and then I can cancel the 2t squareds, um, divide through by uh, uh, 2 and get t is greater than or equal to rx 2 norm squared over 2 uh, minus a half, right? And the minus a half is completely uh, irrelevant because we're uh, minimizing, so it's just going to offset the value of the objective by a half, and therefore I have my constraint that says that t is bigger than x transpose hx over 2. Okay? So that makes sense? Yeah. Uh, how did how did which statement come along? On the left. Right. So this here, I'm going to impose this constraint, and this is a second order cone constraint. And then I'm showing that this constraint is in fact exactly the same as as the constraint that I want. And so I'm showing that I can replace this quadratic objective by a second order cone constraint, and therefore quadratic programs can be implemented in second order cone programs. T is an extra variable, right? So my variables in the second order cone pro program are x, which I had before, and t, which is a new variable, right? And the variable is t, which stands for the objective or the quadratic portion of the objective, uh, and it's constrained to actually stand for the quadratic portion of the objective. And the way I'm implementing this constraint is with one second order cone constraint. Okay. Yes. Um, I just decided to impose this particular second order cone constraint because I worked it out ahead of class that that was going to do what I wanted, right? And so I'm just showing that if I impose this particular second order cone constraint, that it is equivalent to the constraint I want. Right? Oh, so let's see. If I made t equal to x transpose hx over 2, that would be a non-convex constraint. So I don't want that. But it's good enough to make t bigger than or equal to this because we're going to minimize t, right? And therefore, t is going to push hard up against this constraint. Okay. All right. So there's a nice example of a quadratic program and a second order cone program. So that brings up the natural question, do there exist second order cone programs that aren't quadratic programs? Right? I just showed you all quadratic programs are second order cone programs. Are there other ones? And the answer is yes. Uh, quadratically constrained quadratic programs are an example. So here's a, here's a QCQP. Minimize a squared plus b squared, subject to a bigger than x squared, b bigger than y squared, and 2x plus y equals 4. Right? So um, if you, this, so this is not a quadratic program because it has quadratic constraints. Right? Uh, and you can see that it would be rather difficult to implement it with a quadratic program if you notice that um, uh, well, because we're minimizing A, it's going to push hard up against this constraint. Because we're minimizing B, it's going to push hard up against this constraint. right? And so we're going to wind up having that this is equivalent to um, min x squared squared, so x to the fourth plus y to the fourth, subject to 2x plus y equals 4. Right? So it's an it's a L4 norm minimization problem. And you can see that's going to be a bit different from what you can implement with a quadratic program. Right? But you can implement this with a um, second order cone program using the exact same trick uh, as on the last slide. Right? So you can make a second order cone constraint that implements this quadratic constraint, a greater than or equal to x squared. Right? It's a parabola, so I can uh, implement it as an intersection of a plane and a cone. And the same thing with this. A, a parabola is the same as an intersection of a plane and a cone. Okay?
All right. So, um, second order cone programs are great. Um, turns out there's uh, basically two kinds of cone programs that are not linear programs that everybody talks about a lot, and those are second order cone programs and semi definite programs. So, a semi definite constraint, let's define that first. We have some variable x which is in Rn. And we have constant matrices, A1, A2, right, up through AP, let's say. And we're going to constrain the sum over I of uh, Xi times AI. So we're going to put a constraint on that. Uh, and that constraint is that uh, it has to be uh, positive semi-definite, right? Or another way of saying it is that it has to be in the cone of positive semi-definite matrices uh, that are m by m. Right? And so this is a semi-definite constraint. Basically, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I could also have uh, a0 plus that, right? And so I'll put a0 here, right? So I could have a constant offset. Um, uh, and so if I have uh, an optimization problem where I minimize a linear function subject to any number of these semi-definite constraints that I just defined here, as well as your standard linear equalities and inequalities, uh, that's going to be a semi-definite program, or SDP. Okay? So, um, so we'll get to examples of SDPs in just a, just a bit, but... Uh, just to show you, oh yeah. So, xi is a uh, is the ith component of the vector x. Ai is one of our constant matrices. So I'm taking a linear combination of our of our constant matrices, uh, and constraining that to be positive semi-definite. Right. Um, I should say also um, greater than or equal to zero and symmetric, right? Uh, because the, the cone of positive semi-definite matrices, uh, it imposes the symmetric requirement as well. They don't have to be. Uh, it just has to be the case that the thing that um, uh, the, the linear combination has to be symmetric. Um, it, I, it's no loss of generality to say that the constant matrices have to be symmetric as well, um, because any non-constant part has to cancel out, right? But, um, but yeah, uh, the only thing you have to do is say that the outcome has to be symmetric. Okay? What, what is optional? No, symmetric is not optional, right? I mean... You could make something that would behave very much like a semi-definite program without that constraint by saying that, let's say, the symmetrized version of this thing here would have to be uh, in, the, in the cone of positive semi-definite matrices. I don't think that would give you any extra power, uh, but that's not what people usually mean when they say a semi-definite program. Okay. All right. So uh, what does the cone look like? Well, it's a little difficult to visualize because matrices are very high-dimensional objects. So, um, the, so let's see, zero and one-dimensional I can visualize, but it's not very interesting. The smallest interesting case is two-by-two two matrices, which are already four-dimensional. I guess three-dimensional if, uh, if you count the symmetry constraint. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, constrain the trace of the matrix to be equal to one, and then plot the... Uh, so that's one constraint on a three-dimensional object, and plot the remaining two dimensions, uh, right? And that's the intersection of the semi-definite cone uh, with the constraint trace equals one is this fo uh, American football shape, right? Uh, and so what I'm plotting here uh, are the first uh, diagonal element, right? So the trace is 1, so the second diagonal element is 1 minus the first. And then the off-diagonal element, right, the two off-diagonal elements have to be equal, and so that's the other, the other variable, right? And if you go into three dimensions, right, so that has um, six free parameters once you have it uh, symmetric, 
So we have to constrain at least three of them in order to get a three-dimensional object that we can plot. And so if I set the entire diagonal of the matrix to be a third, right, so we have A is equal to a third, a third, oops, uh, a third, then A, B, C, and A, B, C, right? And so I'm plotting here A, B, and C. Right? And this is an approximation. I just generated a whole bunch of random positive semi-definite matrices and took the convex hull. So I think what's actually the case, it's like you have a straight line like this, a straight line like this, and then curved surfaces that connect them. Right? And so it's this uh, lovely gem-like object that, is, uh, uh, that MATLAB plotted for me. And then um, if I want to... Uh, if I want to get another couple of degrees of freedom, what I can do is I can vary the diagonal elements, right? So instead of setting them all to a third, I can vary them between zero and a third and get these sort of uh, sh uh, uh, compressed or, or skewed versions of the same, uh, the same set, right? So that's, that's as high a dimension as I can help you visualize the cone of positive semi-definite matrices. Uh, beyond that, my intuition fails me. But at least um, you can see it's a pretty interesting shape. It has both, uh, it has some nice curved surfaces and some nice points. Uh, and it's going to be, you know, interesting to do an optimization problem over this shape. Right, so this is... Uh, right, so this is the intersection of this cone with the constraint uh, trace equals one, right? And then I'm... Uh, Within the trace equal one constraint, I'm uh, varying what the three diagonal elements are. So they all sum to one, and there's two degrees of freedom for that. And so that's these two degrees of freedom across different plots. And then I'm plotting the off diagonal elements subject to those constraints. Right? So we started with a six dimensional object. We got rid of one dimension with the traces one constraint, two more dimensions by having a two dimensional grid of plots, and then three dimensions left for each one of the plots. Okay, so hopefully that I've convinced you it's kind of a fun object, uh, and later in the lecture I'll try and convince you that it's also a useful object. Uh, all right. So um, one interesting fact about uh, the cone of positive semi-definite matrices is that it's self-dual. And so partly because this is an interesting fact, and partly, again, to give you practice for working with these things, uh, I'll go ahead and prove that. Okay, so uh, just a reminder, this, it's the set of symmetric matrices that are positive semi-definite, right? Uh, and I've written S plus, I could write, you know, S plus in M dimensions, but the constant M, I'm just going to suppress it so I don't have to keep writing it. Um, right, so what I'm going to show you is that uh, being positive semi-definite, meaning X transpose AX is bigger than or equal to zero for all X, is equivalent to trace of B transpose A being greater than or equal to zero for all positive semi-definite B, right? And so this here is showing that uh, the cone is self-dual, right? Because if I take this to be uh, K star, right? And then this is, uh, you know, A dot B. It's the Frobenius product, but it's still A dot B is bigger than or equal to zero. Right? And so if A dot B is bigger than or equal to zero for everything in the dual cone, right, that's the same as uh, being in the primal cone. Okay? So if I succeed in proving this, I will have showed that the matrix is self-dual, that the cone is self-dual. All right. So um, let's do the, uh, the forward implication first. Right? So X transpose AX is bigger than or equal to zero. Um, so uh, suppose I take a positive semi-definite B, right? I can write that as uh, sum over I of XI, XI transpose, right? Uh, one way to do this is through the singular value decomposition. Another way is the Kolesky factorization, right? So there's a bunch of different matrix factorizations I can use to take a positive semi-definite matrix and make it uh, represent it this way, right? So then... Uh, if I have um, uh, the trace of B transpose, not T, B sub T, B transpose uh, A, 
right? That's equal to the sum over i of the trace of xi, xi, tra uh, transpose, transpose a, right? And then I can use trace rotation, uh, sum over i of the trace of uh, xi transpose ax, right? Uh, and that is then the sum over i of xi transpose ax, because the trace of a scalar is the scalar. Uh, each one of these terms is going to be uh, bigger than or equal to 0 uh, exactly when a is positive semi-definite, right? So that's, uh, that's one direction. The other direction um, is uh, suppose that I have that the trace of B transpose A is bigger than or equal to 0 for all positive semi-definite B, right? Well, I can then take B is equal to X, X transpose, and then the trace of B transpose, B transpose A is equal to, for the same reason, x transpose a x, and I just assumed that that was bigger than or equal to zero, right? Because this is a positive semi-definite matrix. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, um, actually, let me just let, I'll just say each one of them again, right? So let's do the bottom one first. So what here is I get to assume that trace of B transpose A is bigger than or equal to zero for all positive semi-definite B. A particular positive semi-definite B is XX transpose. And so the trace of B transpose A is X transpose AX, which uh, I've just assumed is bigger than or equal to zero. And so I've shown that A is positive semi-definite, right? Up here, I get to assume that A is positive semi-definite, right? Uh, and what I have to show is for some particular positive semi-definite B, I have to show that trace of B transpose A is bigger than or equal to zero, right? For some arbitrary positive semi-definite B. So I take that arbitrary positive semi-definite B, I decompose it as a sum of outer products, right? Which is always possible for a positive semi-definite B using, let's say, the Kolesky factorization. Then I... Um, write trace of B transpose A, right? My goal is to prove that that's bigger than or equal to zero. So trace of B transpose A is the sum over each one of these components of trace of X transpose AX, right? XI transpose AXI, uh, which is the same as saying sum of XI transpose AXI is bigger than or equal to zero. But because I assumed A was positive semi-definite, each one of these uh, components is bigger than or equal to zero, and so the whole sum is bigger than or equal to zero. Okay, so uh, you know it's it's a it's a straightforward proof. The most difficult part of the proof is to keep straight which direction you're proving at any given time, right? That's uh, that's the part that I, I kept having to rewrite again when I again and again when I was making these lecture notes. I would accidentally prove one one direction of the implication when I meant the other one. But, uh, but the proof, it's, it's elementary, right? It uses nothing more than the definition of uh, positive semi-definite and trace rotation. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Uh, no. So, for example, take A equal to minus 1, right? then x transpose ax is equal to minus x squared, which is less than or equal to 0 for all x. Right? x transpose ax bigger than or equal to 0 for all x is the definition of positive semi-definite. Okay. All right. So the next obvious question uh, is how hard are quadratic programs and cone programs, right? So it, I've, uh, I'll, I'll spend uh, a bunch of the rest of this lecture trying to convince you that they're nice, flexible, expressive representations, but that wouldn't be so interesting if they were impossible to solve. And so fortunately, maybe not surprisingly, since we're having this lecture, uh, it turns out that they're uh, quite feasible to solve. In fact, they're not much harder than linear programs. Uh, and what that means is that as long as we have an efficient representation of the cone, right? So efficient means, for example, uh, we can project onto it efficiently, or we have a self-concordant barrier function for it, 
Uh, that'll come up later. As long as we have such an efficient uh, representation, uh, then we can solve a quadratic program or a cone program uh, in time that's polynomial in the bit length of the instance and one over epsilon, where epsilon is the accuracy requirement. Right? So that's called polynomial, but not strongly polynomial. Strongly polynomial would be without the one over epsilon, right? meaning that you could do it just in time polynomial in the bit length. Uh, and that's actually a famous open question. Um, so if you can prove it, you get your PhD right about then. Um, probably something else even more valuable, who knows. Uh, and it's open even for linear programs. A lot of people guess that the answer is yes, but we don't know for sure. Okay. Now, uh, that's, that's for convex quadratic programs and convex cone programs. Um, if, you, if you generalize to non-convex quadratic programs or non-convex cone programs, they're NP-complete. So, uh, for example, you can reduce the max cut problem to a non-convex quadratic program pretty easily. Okay? So that convexity thing is important in case you hadn't guessed that from the rest of the course. Um, all right, so let's, uh, let's, do some, uh, let's do some examples. So for quadratic programs, we've already seen a bunch of uh, nice examples. So for example, Euclidean projection, right? If I take some point out here and project it um, by minimum Euclidean distance onto some arbitrary polyhedron, uh, that's a quadratic program, right? Minimize the squared distance subject to the half space constraints that define the polyhedron. Um, you've already seen lasso, which is essentially the same problem, except it's a Malinobis distance, right? A, a, a general quadratic distance instead of the Euclidean distance. Um, I'll go through the example of Huber regression, which is robust regression, um, in a little bit. Uh, and then um, either at the end of this lecture or in the next one, we're going to go to um, almost a whole lecture on support vector machines because support vector machines are just cool uh, and because they're, they're pretty important in, uh, in machine learning and statistics. Right? So that's a, that's a bunch of quadratic program examples. Um, so the lasso example, just quickly, right? if we're trying to fit uh, y equals ax plus b to data that looks like this, and we want the ab vector to be sparse, right? then we'd probably want the answer to look something like this, a horizontal line. Right? And uh, in, in fact, these data were generated at random from a distribution with a equal to 0. But if you just do the least squares fit, a is not going to be equal to 0. So if you look at the lasso objective, it'll look like this. right? So the least squares fit is going to be here. Um, and the contours of the uh, squared error right, are these ellipses. So that's what I mean by minimizing a Malinobis distance. Right? You're minimizing the Malinobis distance from this point, the least squares solution, subject to a constraint that you're within an L1 ball. Right? And so as you um, tighten the constraint, right? if you say you have to be in this L1 ball, well, the answer is still the least squares solution. But if you're in this L1 ball, right, you're going to pull the least square solution down a little bit, right? And what will happen is you'll just keep pulling the least square solution down like this uh, until you hit the axis, right? And then you'll go along the axis until you hit the origin, right? And so here is, uh, you know, if you have, um, if you have uh, the one norm of your weight vector is less than or equal to c, right? Here is c equals to infinity, and here is c equals zero, right? Is the origin. The only feasible point is the origin, so it's pretty easy to solve there. And then the regularization path that connects c equals infinity to c equals zero, it's going to be a collection of line segments like this where we, um, where we follow, uh, follow the optimal solution as we tighten the constraint, right? And the interesting thing is that we hit the origin here, right? And this makes, so this is the, uh, this is the a axis and this is the b axis, right? And so the slope gets to a hard zero before the intercept does. And so we have a sparse solution, okay? So that's lasso. You're probably bored of lasso by now. I don't know. Uh, but we've been using it as an example a lot because it's a nice, a nice example. Um, so let's go to Huber regression. So Huber regression is um, a solution for um, the problem of uh, outliers. 
right? So suppose we're given points uh, xi, yi, right? So xi is in Rn and yi is in R, right? And ordinary least squares regression is to minimize the square distance between yi and xi transpose w, right? Where w is our, is our optimization variable, our weight vector. Um, and one problem is overfitting, uh, which can be due to outliers. Right? So an example would be if you corrupted, if you sampled these things with Gaussian noise, but added some uh, noise from a heavy tailed distribution, the heavy tailed points could completely uh, disrupt the fit and pull the weight vector away from the optimum. So one solution that people propose is to use the Huber loss instead of the square loss, right? So you just minimize the sum of Huber losses instead of squared losses, where um, pictorially, so the squared loss, right, it's some kind of parabola like that, right? So we're looking at now uh, xi dot w minus yi, right? And so the minimum comes at z uh, where the difference is zero. Uh, and it goes up kind of quickly because it's a quadratic. And what the Huber loss is going to do uh, is it's going to take this quadratic uh, and just uh, connect a couple of linear segments to it uh, at plus and minus one, right? Like that. Uh, and so uh, it's going to transition from a quadratic to a linear, and because the slope doesn't keep going up, it's going to not keep increasing the penalty for your error as the error uh, keeps getting bigger, right? So at some point, it's essentially going to mostly give up on fitting this point and only penalize you linearly as the, as the fit gets worse and worse. And so that's going to make you much more ro robust due to, uh, most, much more robust to outliers. So if you uh, want that in equations, it looks like uh, this. Um, you get that the Huber loss is just uh, 2z minus 1, uh, right? So this is z is equal to uh, xi dot w minus yi, right? And it's going to be equal to 2z minus 1 uh, if z is greater than or equal to 1. Uh, it'll be um, minus 2z minus 1 if z, if z is less than or equal to minus 1. And then it'll just be z squared uh, if you're uh, in the interval minus 1 to 1. Right? So let's just quickly prove that that is, in fact, a quadratic program. So I'm going to claim that the Huber loss I can compute using this quadratic program. Uh, and this is just for one example. You just sum this loss over, uh, over a whole bunch of examples, right? So you would have, um, uh, you know, Huber loss of zi is zi ai bi to ai to bi, right? So you'd have uh, an extra variable ai and bi for each, uh, for each example. Uh, and so uh, if you... Uh, if you just try and solve this, right, um, right, so we have two constraints, A and B, less, uh, have to be greater than or equal to zero. So um, rather than trying to solve it as a general quadratic program, there's only four possibilities, right? It could be that both of these two constraints are tight. It could be that only one of them is either the A1 or the B1, or it could be that neither one is tight. And so I'll just check all four possibilities, right? So if we have... Uh, a equals B equals zero. Well, then this is just Z squared plus zero plus zero, right? Z squared. Um, and so uh, this is going to wind up being the middle segment of the Huber loss. Uh, if we um, now take the gradient with respect to A and B, right? So the gradient with respect to A of Z plus A minus B squared plus 2A plus 2b, that's equal to, uh, well, uh, twice z plus a minus b plus 2, right? Um, the gradient with respect to b of this same thing is equal to, uh, well, minus twice z plus a minus b plus 2, right? So now if I... Um, say that both of these gradients are equal to zero, right? That's going to be the case when uh, neither of these constraints are tight, right? Well, then I can just add these two constraints together, right? 
Uh, so I would want to set that equal to zero and that equal to zero, right? If I add those two constraints together, that first part cancels and I get four equals to zero, which I'm guessing we can't satisfy, right? So if we have A greater than zero and B greater than zero, that's going to be uh, impossible, right? What's that? It's going to be impossible because we'd have to have four equals zero in order for, in order for, that, to be, for that to have a solution. Right? So in order to get a minimum away from both of these constraints, the gradient with respect to A and the gradient with respect to B both have to be zero, which means we have to satisfy these two linear equations, which are two parallel lines right, set away from each other, and so they can't be satisfied. Okay? Um, and then uh, the last case is, let's say, A greater than zero and B equal to zero, right? And then the other one's going to be symmetric. Uh, and so if A is greater than zero, then just this top constraint has to be satisfied, right? Uh, and so um, we'll just, uh, we can just solve it, right? And we'll get, uh, we'll divide by two and move uh, things over to the other side, right? And we'll get A is equal to uh, B minus Z minus one, right? Is that what I got before? Uh, so um, if we then, uh, actually what I wanted was the solution for, um, oh, and B is zero, right? So we'll just get rid of that. Um, so I wanted actually the solution for, uh, yeah, so that, that'll, be, that'll be right. So A is equal to minus Z minus one. And so if I just substitute that in, right, I get, uh, z plus a, right, so that's minus z minus 1 squared plus 2 minus z minus 1, right? That cancels. I get 1 there, uh, 1 minus 2z uh, minus, t uh, minus 2, right? So that's going to be minus 1 here. Right? And so this is going to be minus 1 minus 2z, and that's going to be one of the linear branches of the quadratic. Right? And in order for this to be true, uh, it has to be the case that this gradient uh, is, um, it has to be that this equation is feasible. Right? And so uh, that means that um, uh, it's going to be uh, true only if z is less than or equal to minus 1, right? And so it's going to be the branch that's on the left of the, of the Huber, the left branch of the Huber loss function, right? And if we take the symmetric case, we'll get the right branch. And both of these branches, uh, when they're feasible, they're lower than this branch, right? And so it's going to be this branch when nothing else is feasible or one of the two linear cases when they're feasible, okay? And so that just gets us the Huber loss function back. All right. So um, I think uh, now is probably a good time for a brief break. And so we'll come back in a few minutes and uh, talk about cone programs. All right. So uh, so let's get uh, let's get back started again. So. Um, just before, uh, before we get back to the, uh, the technical stuff, um, some administrivia. So first is that we have your homework threes ready. Um, I'll try and end the class a little bit early so that you can pick them up from the TAs. Um, second, today's the last day for our uh, course feedback survey. So uh, if you would f uh, fill that out and tell us you know, anything that we're doing well or poorly, we would be uh, very grateful. Um, next. I've finally gotten all of the back lectures up on YouTube, so you can use those. Hopefully, you can say, you know, yes, I'm studying for my exam by watching YouTube, um, which I don't think I've uh, ever thought was possible before. Um, and of course, they still continue to be downloadable from the course website. Uh, and then, of course, I'm sure nobody's forgotten, but we have a midterm coming up. It's going to be in class right here uh, next Tuesday. It'll be an hour and 20 minutes long, and you're allowed to bring in one sheet of uh, notes, both sides. Uh, 
right? It can be in any font that you can read without a magnifying glass. Um, uh, it's going to be um, sort of uh, short form answer questions, right? So we could ask you to draw diagrams, give proofs that are pretty short, right? Basically just a few lines, um, multiple choice, true, false, right? We could give you fill in the blank, right? Any of these standard types of questions. We're not going to ask you to write an essay. We're not going to ask you to uh, implement an interior point method on the exam. Um, anything else to say? Okay, Brian says you can have a magnifying glass if you want to. All right. Yes? It covers up to the end of Ryan's last segment, which is um, the, a week ago, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Something you can convince us is a U.S. letter or A4. So, uh, also something you can unfold without, like, you know, getting in the way of the people sitting next to you, right? So no tabloids. Uh, all right. So, um, right, we've gotten to the end of the serious questions. So let's get back to um, uh, let's get back to cone programs. Right. So, um, oh yeah, question. So, whoops, that's forward. Here's back. Yeah, so it doesn't show that the V less than 1 is the one. So, that's this constraint here. It has to be the case that the gradient with respect to A is 0, uh, which is only, uh, or sorry, the gradient, with, the gradient with respect to, yeah, this is the gradient with respect to A. Uh, and that has to be uh, zero, so this means that z has to be less than or equal to minus one. Right? And then symmetrically for the other branch, you'll get that z is greater than or equal to plus one. All right, so cone programs. Um, so you, we've mentioned group lasso before. Uh, we didn't say, I don't think, that it's a cone program, uh, but it is. So. Um, both group lasso and sparse group lasso are going to be second order cone programs. So the way you can see this, um, so the problem is we're given a whole bunch of uh, uh, groups G, uh, let's say um, G are, uh, each of the GI are subset or equal to um, the integers from 1 to N, right? So this is a set of indices. Uh, we have um, uh, uh, and then we have the, the constraint, right? So these are, these are indices. And what we want to do is take the subvector of x corresponding to, um, I guess we'll call it w, our optimization variable. We'll take the subvector of w corresponding to these indices and constrain its two norm, <coughs> right? So the problem is going to be to uh, minimize the norm of a vector y minus matrix x times w, right? So x contains our uh, input variables, y is our output variables. Uh, we'd like to minimize the squared 2 norm of that, <coughs> plus lambda, which is the um, sparsity penalty parameter, times the sum over all of our groups i of the norm of x sub g, right? So, sorry, not x sub g, but uh, w sub g, right? And that's the two norm not squared. And what I mean by w sub g is g is a set of indices, and I'm taking the subvector of w corresponding to those indices, right? Uh, g i, w sub g sub i, right? So that's the, this is the uh, group lasso, right? And then the sparse group lasso would be plus mu times the uh, one norm of w. Okay. Um, so to represent that as a second order uh, cone program, right, uh, we're going to uh, have uh, this same um, quadratic objective, right? So uh, 
uh, it'll be minimize t uh, plus uh, lambda sum over i ti, right? So there's going to be one extra variable for each one of these norm constraints that we want to uh, compute, right? Subject to, and then we'll have t is greater than or equal to the squared 2 norm of y minus xw, right? And uh, ti is greater than or equal to the unsquared 2 norm of uh, w sub g sub i. Right? And this here, this is directly a second order cone constraint. Right? And then I showed uh, a few slides ago how to take a quadratic constraint like that and turn it into a second order cone constraint. Right? So we can implement group lasso that way, and you can add the one norm penalty using the same trick that we did before. Right? We have uh, uh, basically just uh, two constraints saying that the absolute value is greater than wi and greater than or equal to minus wi. Okay? So that makes sense. The, the sparse group lasso is a second order cone program. Okay. Um, I'm not going to have time to go to, into this in any detail, uh, but I wanted to mention it because it's cool. There's a recent paper by uh, Kumar, Kolmogorov, and Tor uh, in Journal of Machine Learning Research, which shows that inference in a discrete Markov random field, <clears throat> there are some nice relaxations of that as second order cone programs. And so to see the details of those, they would take a lecture in and of themselves, but they're in the, they're in the paper, and I encourage you to go take a look. And then the, the last example that I want to give um, is minimum volume covering ellipsoid, right? So I have a whole bunch of uh, points, right? So I'll take an ellipsoid. One way to represent an ellipsoid is the set of uh, vectors x such that the norm uh, of ax plus b is less than or equal to 1, right? So what does this ellipsoid look like, right? So if a were the identity, this would be a unit ball. Right? And if A is not the identity, it's going to be the inverse image of the unit ball under a linear mapping, and the inverse image of a ball is an ellipsoid. Right? So uh, if I have a whole bunch of points xi and I want to constrain each one of them to be inside this, uh, so our variables are going to be A and B, and I want to constrain a whole bunch of points xi to be in the, the corresponding ellipsoid, well, I just have A times xi plus B is less than or equal to 1. But I can write that as a second order cone constraint, right? Which is that uh, A xi plus B uh, comma 1 uh, is in the second order cone, right? That just says the 2 norm of A xi plus B is less than or equal to 1. Um, and then the volume of the... Um, uh, the volume of the unit ball is something, right? It's pi times the dimension in, you know, something to the dimension, right? Um, and so uh, what, we, um, what we get then is that the volume of the ellipsoid uh, is um, the determinant of uh, A inverse, right? Um, the absolute value of that. Uh, times the volume of the original unit ball, but I'm just going to drop that because a constant factor doesn't matter, right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to um, uh, minimize that volume, but instead of minimizing the volume directly, we'll minimize the log of the volume, right? And so this is going to wind up being a convex function of the matrix A, right? Uh, and it's a... Uh, and then we have these second order cone constraints. So it's like a second order cone program, except that it has this nonlinear objective. And it's going to turn out that you can actually handle the nonlinear objective with a lot of the algorithms uh, for solving second order cone programs. Okay? So that's a bunch of, uh, a bunch of examples of second order cone programs. Um, Semi definite programs uh, are even more flexible. Um, you've seen the graphical lasso in one of your homeworks. Uh, so that, again, is going to wind up being a semi-definite program with a nonlinear objective, um, right? If you, if you remember, it was something like this. You minimize <coughs> the trace of x transpose x, 
<coughs> where um, S here, this was uh, the empirical covariance, right? <coughs> Minus um, the uh, log of the determinant of X. Uh, plus lambda times the sum for all i not equal to j of the absolute value of uh, x i j, right? And so, um, oh, and then there's a constraint, of course, that the uh, x, which stands for the inverse covariance, has to be positive semi-definite and symmetric. Right? And so there's one semi-definite constraint here. We have a linear, uh, linear pieces of the objective. Right? We can write this as linear objective subject to some linear inequality constraints. This is a linear part of the objective. Then this is nonlinear, but we can compute its uh, gradient, for example, and we can use that in, a, uh, in an optimization algorithm. Okay? Right, right. So the, the uh, Aditya makes a good point that what I said before was that uh, not the matrix X itself, right? Uh, so I, if I have an optimization variable X, my SDP constraints were of the form sum of AI XI is positive semi-definite. But here I can make a matrix capital X by taking little x to be all of the entries of that matrix strung out, and the AIs are matrices with zeros everywhere except for a one here or a one here or a one here, right? And so the entries of the matrix wind up being exactly the same as my optimization uh, variables. That's a very good point, and I should, I should have mentioned it's a simple reduction, but if you haven't seen it before, it could be confusing. Okay. Um, all right, questions um, about the graphical lasso? All right, uh, so uh, I'm also not going to cover this, but uh, it's in your book, Boyd and Vandenberg, uh, Markowitz portfolio optimization, where you're trying to trade off the risk and the return of a portfolio. Turns out you can write that as a semi-definite program, and it's kind of interesting to, to see how to do so. There's a famous relaxation of the max cut problem. So max cut is NP complete, but Gomans and Williamson showed how to um, relax it as a semi-definite program. And for a long time, it was the best relaxation that anybody knew. Uh, so it's a classic paper. I encourage you to, to look it up and take a look because it's kind of a cool semi-definite program. Um, and then I'm going to go through the examples of matrix completion, which you've seen at least briefly before, uh, and manifold learning through max variance unfolding. So uh, let's start with uh, matrix completion. So we have some um, matrix A, and we observe some of its elements, right? Aij for ij in some set E. Uh, and what I'm going to do, just for uh, simplicity of notation, uh, I'm going to write um, Pij to be uh, one if Ij is in, whoops, if Ij is in E and zero otherwise, right? And uh, what I want to do is uh, minimize the squared reconstruction error, right? So this is uh, my optimization variable is going to be x. Uh, and I'm going to um, minimize uh, x minus a, um, Hadamard product with p, right? So that's going to mask out only the, um, it'll keep only the entries which we've observed, take, <clears throat> take the sum of their squares, the Frobenius norm, plus lambda times the trace norm of x, right? The nuclear norm of x. And uh, so, we argued before that this solving this optimization problem, right, that this, that this term here is a proxy for wanting a low rank x. And so what this is going to do is trying to get a low rank x that does as well as possible at fitting the matrix, uh, the observed entries of your matrix A. Okay? And my claim is that this is a semi-definite program. 
it's not at all obvious at the moment. Uh, but what I'm going to do is uh, claim that this term is going to be the same as uh, lambda times the trace of the matrix P, which is going to be another optimization variable, plus the trace of the matrix Q, yet another optimization variable over 2. Uh, oh, yes. Um, uh, um, we'll call this one O, right? And we'll call that one O there, right? Uh, we'll make it here. We'll make a little curly script O here so that it's obviously not a zero, okay? <laughs> So now, now it's distinct both from the numeral zero and from my uh, and from my optimization variable p. Thank you for pointing that out. It's pretty funny, right? You 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 go through you you look at this derivation a million times, and these are two separate variables in your head. So it never occurs to you to confuse the two of them. But then, as soon as you write it up in front of uh, you know several dozen people, uh, it becomes obvious. All right. So subject to a constraint. And the constraint is going to be that this matrix, uh, P, X, X transpose, and Q, right? So that matrix is going to have to be positive semi-definite, right? Uh, and so I've added these extra variables. I've put them on the diagonal of this block matrix here, right? And again, you can, you can see how to make this constraint out of the constraints of the form sum of AI, XI is positive semi-definite, right? You just take the elements of X and you put them in the off-diagonal blocks and the elements of P and Q and put them in the on-diagonal blocks. And now what I have to do is show that this uh, positive semi-definite constraint is equivalent to this uh, trace norm constraint, right? And so um, for the first part of the proof, uh, suppose that... Uh, um, I'm going to try decomposing x is equal to u sigma v transpose, right? I can do that whatever the value of my optimization variable x is. And these, obviously, they're not going to be a convex function of x, but they're also not going to appear in the program. They're just part of the proof. Um, and let's call this matrix up here capital M, right? This big matrix P, X, X transpose Q. And so... Um, We showed earlier that the positive semi-definite cone was self-dual, right? And so that means that uh, M being positive semi-definite is equivalent to saying that uh, trace of B transpose M is greater than or equal to zero for all positive semi-definite B, right? And so in particular, I'm going to take... Uh, B to be the following, um, U, U transpose, V, V transpose, and then uh, minus U, V transpose, and minus V, U transpose, right? Uh, and so uh, we know that um, zero is less than or equal to the trace of B transpose M, right? Um, which is then equal to, uh, right? And so the trace of B transpose M, um, I can actually just do it component-wise or block-wise, right? So it's going to be uh, the trace of U, uh, U transpose P for the top block, right? Plus the uh, trace of V, V transpose Q for the bottom right block, right? minus twice the trace of uh, um, V U transpose X, right? So that's going to be one for each of these blocks and then a transpose to collect the terms, right? So now by trace rotation... Um, well, actually, it's, it's easy, right? So... Um, 
U, U transposes the identity, right? V, V transposes also the identity, right? And so I have um, here there's going to be the trace of P plus the trace of Q, right? And then I'm going to move this one over here, right? So this is going to be greater than or equal to twice the trace of, and now I'm going to use trace rotation, U transpose X, V, right? But U transpose X, V then is just sigma, right, by this decomposition up here, okay? Uh, which is equal to twice the trace norm of X, okay? So now I've shown that uh, if we have M satisfying this constraint, then lambda times trace of P plus trace of Q over 2 is at least as large as lambda times the nuclear norm of X. And now what I have to do is show that I can actually get it down by appropriate choice of P and Q. I can get it down to be equal to, the, uh, to that uh, trace norm. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm going to take... Uh, P is equal to U sigma U transpose, and Q is equal to uh, V sigma V transpose, right? Um, and so now uh, we have that the trace of P is, well, the trace norm of X, right? Because uh, trace of P is equal to the trace of uh, U transpose U sigma, right? And the U transpose U goes away, and the trace of sigma is the trace norm of X. Same thing for the trace of Q, right? So um, we now have that trace of P plus trace of Q, uh, which is equal to the uh, trace of M here, by the way. Uh, trace of P plus trace of Q um, is equal to twice the trace norm of X. Right, uh, And so now all we have to do is show that this P and Q makes the matrix positive semi-definite. Right? So our matrix now is going to be um, U sigma U transpose uh, X, which is U sigma V transpose uh, X tr uh, minus, uh, minus V sigma U transpose V sigma V transpose, right? This is our matrix M. And I have to show that that's positive semi-definite. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an orthogonal transformation of this matrix. And orthogonal transformations preserve the trace norm. And the orthogonal transformation is uh, U0, 0, 0, V uh, transpose U0, 0, 0, V. Right? And so that, if you multiply it out, that's just going to be sigma minus sigma minus sigma and sigma. Right? And then by inspection, that's positive semi-definite. Just like the matrix 1 minus 1 minus 1, 1 is positive semi-definite. Right? And so um, just taking it all together, uh, for any P and Q, uh, this, this term in the objective is going to be bigger than or equal to the trace norm of X. I can pick P and Q such that it's equal to the trace norm of X. And so if I impose this constraint and do this minimization, I'm going to wind up solving the original matrix completion problem. Okay? Uh, and so this is um, a semi-definite program with a quadratic objective. If I want to, I can get rid of the quadratic objective by turning it into a cone constraint, but in fact it's uh, just as easy to have a quadratic part of your semi-definite program. All right. Any questions about the matrix completion? So let's, uh, let's stop here, and don't forget you can pick up your homework threes from the TAs. <laughs>